It was to Clarin that I returned in the autumn of 1911 to realize that vision I had already had while finishing the Ferbert. We rented an apartment in a pension, which by coincidence was next door to a house owned by the conductor Ernest Ansgemey. And there, in a tiny room, a closet rather, on the third floor, eight foot by eight foot, I composed the Rite of Spring, Le Sacre du Printemps. That's the room where I composed the Sacre du Printemps. And it's not this, this one also. <laughs> This is what I saw. I presented this room to be alone. I saw these mountains, a little bit trees, and I composed here almost the whole Sacre du Printemps. I put my table here, and the chair here, and I put the piano on this wall. I worked from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. I remember very well that at, at this time, or uh, at this period of my life, I didn't take naps. I just worked. And after eating, I went to the piano and I continued to work. Afterwards, it was the five o'clock tea. I didn't pay much attention to it. And it was a dinner time. And I was there with my dear wife, and I continued to work after the dinner. When I was very, very tired, I went to bed. And I remember I slept very well. When I composed the first part of the sacre, Jagger invited me to Venice. And I say, your invitation was very welcome, because I will play you something which you will probably stage. Go ahead, go ahead. That's OK. And I started to play him this chord, 59 times the same chord. Degadev was a little bit surprised. He didn't pay attention to the different uh, rhythms a rhythmical sense of this chord because I make I made the accents on different places. And so being a little bit embarrassed, annoyed, and he didn't want to offend me. He asked me only one thing, which was very offending. He asked me, will it last a very long time this way? And I said, to the end, my dear. And he was silent, because he understood that the answer was serious. The costumes were by Röhrig. Although they were very like Russian peasant costumes I had seen in my youth. When the pianist sat down and started playing, Stravinsky jumped up like a madman and said, what are you doing? That is not a tempo. We got, got to go. In such a tempo that nobody could dance, Nijinsky was absolutely squashed and said, we can't do it like that. Stravinsky said, it will be done like that. As Nijinsky was doing the thing, it would have lasted years. And he sat down to the piano, began to play with frantic speed and bang on the top of the piano and bang on the air everywhere to obtain sounds to give us an idea. I like very much this chord. Of course, the chord was a rather new chord, you know, eight notes chord. But the accents were even more new. And the accents were really the foundation of the whole thing. 
This is, uh, you know, the oracle poet. Tam ti ram de rim pam pam tim pam de rim pim pam pam rim pam pam pim and so on and so on. That, that's very good. Yeah. That accompaniment. You, I could find something more interesting than it is. It is not on the same level of interest. Yeah. There are pages of the sacra which I like, yes. and I find them interesting today. Yes, and they are. Tens of pages, which I am absolutely indifferent. Yagilev encouraged me to use a huge orchestra. I am not sure my orchestra would have been as large otherwise, but this did allow me to build chords and harmonies much richer and more complex than ever before. Above all, however, it was the rhythm that was shocking. I used no regular meters. I was interested in constructing phrases of different lengths and in a totally new language of rhythm. So new, in fact, that the sacrificial dance at the end, in which a chosen virgin dances herself to death, I could play, but I did not at first know how to write. The ballet was performed at the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées, which I revisited some 52 years later. Your parents were not born when I knew this theater in 13. They played a work which you know by name, the Sacre du Printemps. It was the biggest scandal in the last 50 years, you know, in the theater. I was sitting there, there, and the scandal started here. But when the curtain came up, and I saw what Nijinsky did as choreography, it started to be tremendous, you know, the noise. And Nijinsky was there on such a chair, just standing, yeah, and conducting under the corps de ballet, say, seven, eight, nine. Nijinsky sat on a high chair in the wings, but visible to us, trying to, to keep us in time. And I was in the ensemble to help them. Somebody from the gallery shouted, Un docteur, because you're so ill. Somebody else said, Un dentiste, because she... <laughs> Then somebody else shouted, De dentiste. Dreadful. We had been told to go on dancing, and it was a dreadful failure. However, we came to the end, and Nijinsky jumped down. The Quakerton was already down, and said, Dura publica means the idiot public. It was full of very noisy public. I went out, I said, go to hell. Excuse me, Monsieur Hidan. They came for, for, for Scheherazade or for Cleopatra, and they saw the Sacre du Printemps. They were very shocked. They were very naive and stupid people. It has nothing to do with the art. The company felt furious, but then they hated the ballet because, I mean, they loved to show off their beauty and their graceful arms and graceful head movements and all that. All that was banished and considered ugly, ugly, ugly. I was guided by no system whatever. Very little immediate tradition lies behind the Sacre du Printemps and no theory. I had only my ear to help me. I heard, and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the sucker passed. And I remember that I put on this door, knowing that I am composing something very important, that in this room I am composing the sucker du printemps. Clarin, 1911. Igor Stravinsky, 